and yes. start the presentation. Um, so I am happy to be here. Um, thank you guys for having us. It's very exciting to be speaking to you guys today. Um, my name is Christian Reese, um, and I'm here today to talk to you guys about behavioral data and supplier negotiations with my close friend and colleague, Michael Oliveri. Um, before we jump into the content of the presentation, um, I would like to introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Christian Reese. Um, I'm actually an attorney by education and background. Started my career in mergers and acquisitions and then became a supply chain consultant. Um, I was tasked with sourcing and negotiating large spend and high volatility agreements. Um, and then I later became a champion of implementation of new technology and supply chain, um, uh, you know, in accounts payable, sourcing, rev cycle management, um, even as far as blood procurement and par level management and value management. Uh, I was able to achieve best in class pricing nationally for blood, which I thought was a pretty cool achievement and source to sole source MSP um, that I, I got accommodation from the CFO um, for. And based on all of my experience in digital transformation and supply chain, uh, I co-founded BitOps, which is a SaaS software first mover in the sourcing space that leverages artificial intelligence to enable negotiations. I recently had a, uh, an equity exit from that company and pivoted back into consulting, uh, where I am with the Newport Beach firm, Sharpless Healthcare Consulting, growing rapid growth and SaaS businesses in the procurement space for companies um, like Amazon and City of Hope. Uh, when I'm not working, I am a dad to one. I'm husband to my high school sweetheart, love the national parks, and I surf over 300 times a year. So we're gonna go, go right into Michael. He's always a tough act to follow. Um, <laughs> Uh, Mike Oliveri, uh, Christian, thanks for uh, passing it on. Um, uh, I have uh, uh, over 30 years of experience uh, working uh, in uh, uh, sales marketing and, uh, uh, and supply chain for Fortune 100 organizations, uh, including brands like PepsiCo, uh, Toys R Us, Dun & Bradstreet. Um, my most recent experience, I, I did work with Christian while we were both at BitOps. Um, and uh, I also worked for, uh, prior to BitOps, I was the director of business development for a GPO, uh, actually managing seven categories of indirect spend, totaling about $800 million for our clients. Uh, 18 years of my career were dedicated to developing and implementing technology solutions uh, in the areas of category management and supply chain optimization. Uh, I'm currently a vice president and board director uh, for the Philadelphia chapter of the ISM. Um, so hello fellow ISM folks. Um, and in my current role, I am director of sales and procurement services for CoreCentric uh, for their private fleet and carrier business. Um, when I'm not working, uh, kind of proud dad of four very talented kids. Uh, I am a published poet. Amanda, like you, I read a lot as well. So I, I did make note of that book. Uh, and I am a diehard Philly sports fan, but I'm not the typical Philly sports fan, so don't hold that against me. <laughs> that, that's it for me. Thanks. We will hold it against you anyway, Michael. Um, <laughs> we are going to go into our next slide here. And it's actually for a question um, from the audience. What we'd like to do here is have you guys on mute and maybe take one or two answers to this question. Our first question is, why is behavioral data important in supplier negotiations or even buyer negotiations? Now, I can't see if anybody is talking. Let me see here. Nobody unmuted yet. Not all at once. And if, if nobody wants to go first, who wants to go second? <laughs> to that question. <laughs> I mean, we could answer our own questions if we really need to, but uh, prefer to hear from you guys. All right, so you want to get a feel of how you think the meeting is going to be held? Get the be great, guy. That's a fantastic answer. Um, we we have you know there's there's a lot of reasons why data is important. We've identified four main ones. Um, we're going to jump right into them here. So I'm going to take you guys to the next slide. Bear with me. 
Um, so the first point we have here is that negotiations are emotive. Um, stakeholders, sourcing managers, and suppliers, they, they build relationships over the course of an agreement. Uh, an end user can develop an emotional relationship with a process, a, a service, or an item that they are using to, to do their job. Uh, and that can pull negotiations into the subjective and ethereal. And, and you could be influenced by externalities that aren't related to performance or pricing. Great. Thank you, Christian. And folks, as we all know, we're all procurement professionals. Uh, we know that negotiations can be adversarial. Uh, a situation in a negotiation, a typical RFQ, reverse auction, always prone to conflict. Uh, there's a lot of complex decision making going on on both ends uh, and limited amounts of resources. Uh, and it's a task where uh, people need to be strategic, whether you're the buyer or the supplier on, on, on the end of the negotiation process. Uh, and you're always focused on gaining the best possible outcome for you. So the behavior of each individual is highly influenced uh, by his or her uh, opponent's behavior. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. Thanks, Mike. I just want to call out, this was uh, highlighted by a great point in my breakout session, um, where one of my colleagues in that session uh, said she reported to a military person who said, you know, treat your negotiation advers uh, adversary like your enemy and learn everything about them which I thought was great, but didn't want to show my cards too much at my excitement. So thank you for making that point. Um, and this is a, a, another good point here, which is that procurement executives have a pretty delicate balance to make, which is keeping stakeholders happy, supplier relationships working and positive. Um, and they need to come up with procurement decision-making decisions that are a blend of both. You can't make a decision that's totally emotive, and a lot of times you can't make a decision that's um, totally data-driven, and therefore we have to leverage both to achieve cons uh, consistent decisions. And what this statement um, from Forbes is saying is that you need to uh, put your best foot forward and make efforts to develop both the human uh, side of it and technology roles so you can uh, have the best outcomes for your supplier negotiations. So this is another audience question. Mike, I'm gonna let you take the lead on this. Yeah, thanks, Christian. So uh, I'd like to hear maybe a couple answers on what type of behavioral data you think is important in your negotiations with suppliers. Anybody wanna weigh in? If you wanna put it in the chat, go ahead and do that. And maybe Robert, you can call it out. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll be looking for anybody that's a little bit shy. <laughs> All right, well, let's kind of, let's move on to, uh, to uh, our next slide, Christian. Sure. Um, um, so go ahead, yeah. Mike. No, it's yours. Uh, the, the first type of behavior data that we, um, you know, really want to dive into is utilization data. And you guys are probably all rolling your eyes. There's a lot of you have hidden your, uh, your beautiful faces. But utilization means a couple things. We're talking about the deeper dive beyond what your XLS or CSV says about price and utilization. We're talking deep dives into the utilization data that can extract, extract trends in seasonality, um, how par levels of items are being managed at facilities, ordering behaviors, um, and whether or not an incumbent supports those costly behaviors. Um, the second of which is, is responsiveness data. Um, and here we're really talking about how, the how of the communication with the vendor during negotiations and what that tends to indicate, um, whether it's willingness or a lack of willingness to complete a deal. Thanks, Christian. And uh, two other types of data that are really important one, historical performance data. So uh, probably the, one of the best measurements on seeing how an incumbent values their relationship with your organization. Uh, delivery times, responsiveness, you know, corrective actions that are needed, and projected spend versus actual spend. Key information to have uh, when you're in a negotiation process. And then also demand data, kind of your stakeholder demand and urgency to close a deal can send signals to your suppliers that might reduce or at least impact uh, their likelihood of 
putting their best foot forward in terms of savings for you. Thanks, Mike. Um, we have another audience question here, and, and uh, I think it's probably best to stick with that chat function so nobody needs to worry about mute. Um, but what sort of stakeholder behavior insights have you extracted from utilization? Love to hear from you guys. Give it a couple minutes here, a couple moments. It could just be that you're asking really good, challenging questions. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I, I think we're happy to jump into it then. And if they trickle in, feel free to uh, interrupt and, and call them out. Um, so in utilization data, we're talking uh, uh, about looking for more than just items ordered and current spend. Um, and, and we like to use benchmarking, data scientists, and uh, tools like databases and matching algorithms to turn fuzzy data into clear pictures of seasonality, as well as identify outlier behavior and other trends that may be important to understanding um, how you are going to buy, especially if you represent uh, a shared services supply chain that represents one or more different departments of the business drivers. It's really important to understand what their behavior looks like. Um, and, and we even go so far as to interview stakeholders, investigate workflows, and investigate the history and origins of stakeholder behavior and the influence on the utilization and how uh, that utilization has impacted supplier relationships across the history of the contract before we go into a sourcing event. Uh, Christian, let's pause for a second. We got a great question that was put out there by Gary to the sure. group. Uh, as far as how you go about collecting the data. Um, I could jump in on that, Gary, uh, if you want me to, uh, to field some of that. Christian, if you can weigh in as well. Absolutely. Uh, well, there's various ways of going about collecting that data. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go through the presentation. But certainly, uh, you know, your ERP systems, you know, what data are you capturing uh, relative to the specific contracts that you've negotiated? And how are you maintaining that data? Um, certainly, um, you know, the collective knowledge of your buyers within your organization and with, within the suppliers. So what you know about previous negotiations with each other, uh, you have to actually maintain some kind of repository for collecting that information. Um, a big change in our industry is digitization. Uh, you know, it's a term that everybody is beat up. Uh, and artificial intelligence. Uh, there are technologies out there that allow you to capture each interaction with a supplier and how they respond to you and vice versa. So there's various ways of collecting that information. Uh, you know, at the end of our conversation today, Christian and I are gonna give you our contact information. Uh, we are welcome to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with anyone interested in taking that further. Thanks, Mike. And, and some of the other ways that, that Michael has had made mention of is that your ERP system will generally uh, track when purchases are made and tie them to purchase orders and all those other items of the like. What I like to do is rather than request a, you know, a tailored data from a data management team, I like to uh, take the raw data dump from accounts payable and tend to build my own databases in Excel um, to extract a lot of those trends. Um, I, t I break it down to site level facility specific procurement, look at regional specific procurement, and I just take the, uh, the way I extract the data is I, I think of the data as a, a big circle that I make smaller concentric circles to achieve. So I start with the smallest concentric circle and then I work outwards till I have a big picture and understand all of the utilization trends. Uh, it is a little more, you know, tailored and does take a little more time, but I find that you can come up with very unique insights about regionality and utilization, seasonality and utilization, and, uh, you know, poor, poor materials management behavior um, from a lot of your end users. So the evidence um, to support this is uh, well, well stated by the uh, Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply in, in their white paper called Behavioral Procurement. Um, and what they say is that our human rationality is limited um, to the tractability of the decisions problem, uh, meaning that you have within your own brain cognitive limits 
that you can reach and that's called confirmation bias. Um, and so a lot of times you will look at really non-nuanced data and go to the easiest decision that doesn't rock the boat. They call this satisfices because it's a half satisfaction, half sacrifice. Um, and you're just seeking the minimally viable solution rather than an optimal one. Um, and, and what they conclude in this white paper is that behavioral data points in regards to utilization can remove that confirmation bias from stakeholders and ma make your negotiations with suppliers and even the internal negotiations you have to have with your stakeholders more rational and less emotive. Um, because you're looking at numbers rather than I feel this or I think that, um, which really has a way of also increasing your throughput. A good example of this is, I, is one of the large IDNs that I worked for when I was uh, consulting was they had abnormally high blood spend in one of their blood banks. It was 40% over similar departments. Um, when you looked at the, the high level utilization data, the price point was not abnormally high to justify the data. And the blood procurement, um, when you, uh, you know, kind of juxtaposed that to the utilization demand from patients, it didn't match. Um, there was a mismatch. So we went in, we did um, kind of like the Toyota and Coca-Cola lean exercises on their workflow and found that the blood bank had an aversion to using short dated products. Um, which is a blood product with less than seven days. There's no difference in clinical effectiveness. Um, so he was essentially returning and discarding clinically effective products in fear that he would waste them. Um, and, and we also found that the enterprise resource uh, platform didn't support the sharing of blood products between sister hospitals, some as close as four miles away, um, for product rotation to avoid that wastage. Um, so he was utilized, also he was utilizing specialty products like cross-matched and phenotyped blood when in any type, uh, you know, like an O negative would work at a cheaper price point. So when we found all this, we, we, we compiled this data and went back to our negotiating table. And in the renegotiation with the incumbent, who unfortunately was, uh, you know, fortunately and unfortunately was uh, our best choice because of some uh, local SLAs, we got an 8% price point reduction. We were able to eliminate that rotation fee based on the fact that we found out they were essentially supporting behavior that they knew to be uh, not best in class um, through continuing to allow them to, to behave in that manner. And then we worked to break down those ERP barriers um, so they could engage in proactive resource sharing, again, supported by the incumbent, and the use of behavioral data, especially how they bought and utilized in that blood bank, drove a 27% reduction in product utilization. And we also had the vendor agree to lead some education programs on specialty versus generics um, and, and how that impacts your overall blood utilization. So that was a really clear cut example of how we leveraged stakeholder and supplier behavior to come to an, a more optimal negotiation outcome. Great, thanks for that, Christian. Uh, before we jump into the next audience question, there was a question from Eric Coney. Uh, what data management company would you recommend? Uh, great question, and Eric, there are multiple answers to that question. Um, some of it is contingent upon the size of company that you work for, so typically, uh, and Christian, you can weigh in at, at, at any point as well. Typically for enterprise size organizations, uh, you know, large pharma companies that I've worked for, large consumer packaged goods companies, um, uh, the ERP systems uh, integrate with CRM systems like Salesforce, and you're collecting information there. Uh, I don't want to call out any particular, uh, not that this is an endorsement, but you have contract management systems such as SAP Ariba. Uh, that actually become a repository for your contracting information and collecting all the information you can about uh, a supplier and a negotiation. Um, uh, but then there are many other solutions as well that are meant for mid-market and small businesses. Um, Christian, if you want to add to that, but uh, again, this is something I love talking about. So uh, I would invite you to reach out to me or Christian on LinkedIn or email would love to continue that conversation. And Eric, uh, with you in particular, happy to dive deep with you on that. 
<clears throat> Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, well, being that I have a, a background in, in consulting, especially in healthcare, we, we relied heavily on companies like MD Byline and MedPricer for some of our market research. Um, and then really, uh, we just, we went to, uh, you know, EBSCO host and, and some more intellectual and academic uh, outlets, I guess you could call them, to get academic research on, on what an optimized supply chain in those verticals looked like. Um, and then actually, we uh, many times, depending on the complexity and size of the bid, go actually um, ask for that that data set from the person who wrote the white paper, and you'd be surprised. We, we got a lot of good bites on it. Great. Thanks, Christian. Um, so uh, next question for the audience, what sort of supplier behavior insights have you extracted from a supplier's responsiveness or lack of responsiveness? Give it a couple Mr. moments. Robert, see chat. Okay. I'll keep the, okay. keep the chat monitored. Thank you. Thank you so we're going to go right in here. Um, yeah. Mike, I believe this is uh, me. Yeah. So uh, another key component here is responsiveness data, okay? Um, and when I say responsiveness, I'm trying to take, take the emotive out of this, okay? So during any type of a negotiation track, there's interactions between buyers and suppliers. Uh, what you want to measure is the number of touch points per supplier uh, and the number of clarifying questions that are asked by the suppliers throughout the negotiation process. And then the time to respond. Uh, those are all important factors that are gonna give you a clue uh, as to how engaged your suppliers are and engaged being a synonym for responsive. How engaged are they with you uh, throughout the negotiation process? It's more than just relational. It kind of describes, and you're gonna get a clear picture of whether or not the supplier is willing to work with you to meet your expectations. And not just on pricing, but on SLAs and non-price related factors that are important to your process. Uh, a good uh, uh, piece of evidence on this is uh, that analyzes kind of human negotiation uh, behavioral analysis is the Druckmann bargaining model. Uh, very simply what that is, it is, is it assumes that each bargainer, so buyers and suppliers, each bargainer's concession is directly related to the other's previous concession in an action cycle. So you as the buyer uh, are going to react to the supplier's reaction to your requests. Uh, in this 1976 model, they conducted experiments and found that uh, concessions had a direct relationship to responsiveness. So meaning that uh, the more responsive negotiator is more likely to concede earlier than a less responsive, I don't like to use the word adversary, but a, a, a less responsive negotiator uh, who is likely to provide concessions only when there's multiple rounds. So in, in the scenario where you have multiple round types of negotiations, the responsiveness, responsiveness could be more reciprocal and even, even across the board. Um, Christian's got a couple of examples that give you a picture of the types of uh, 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 responsiveness uh, data that, uh, that we're talking about, what their personas are. Thanks, Mike. In, indeed, I do. So this was uh, a an experience that I had, kind of a strange experience, if I'm being honest with you, at a, a large manufacturing company um, where one of my sourcing managers uh, who was working on this project went out of office and forgot to set an out of office notification um, and response in his email. And a supplier submitted a quote. And the initial quotation went unacknowledged and unresponded to for two weeks. And um, when that sourcing manager returned from his vacation, he found that he had missed five phone calls from the supplier and read the first email, looked at the quote, found it not to be totally that far off the mark, but found that his lack of responsiveness had actually incentivized a further discounted quote um, in his inbox uh, before he even responded to the first one. 
So the supplier took his lack of responsiveness, which was in this case, totally inadvertent and just based on the fact that he was on a cruise um, and took that non-responsiveness as like, oh, maybe my pencil wasn't sharp enough and actually negotiated against himself. Um, so I, I kind of personified that as a deal maker where the lack of responsiveness, uh, in, it, it's almost like a people pleasing response. Uh, you know, I haven't heard back, let me check in. Maybe I'm off the mark and, and they sharpen their pencil. And I found that to be a, a pretty good example of how uh, lack of responsiveness from a buyer can actually influence supplier performance. And then in our next slide, um, I, I have the inverse of that example, which is called a bull, or at least that's what I call it. So at a large IDN, I was working on a human biologics RFP and a, lo a local tissue bank was actually unresponsive to sourcing managers. Um, the sourcing manager called and emailed, didn't get any responses, and the other suppliers in the RFP could not meet the site requirements um, this particular hospital, I'm not, if, I'm not sure, totally sure if you guys are familiar with Northern California, um, was in Eureka, which is through a pass that's potentially snowed out between three and five months out of the year uh, and impassable for people coming from the south. Um, so the vendor was unresponsive and flat out refused to negotiate with the shared services supply chain, and it was left to the site to negotiate independently and the final contract price negotiated was actually 40% above market and 30% above prior pricing. That lack of responsiveness from the vendor had a direct correlation to the bottom line of the business. Great examples, Christian. Thank you, brother. Thanks, Mike. Um, so we have another audience question here. We'll keep going with our process where you could put it in the chat. What sort of supplier behavior insights have you extracted from historical performance data. Um, so next slide, what do we mean by historical performance data? Um, tracking and using historical data, such as service failures, et cetera, that's non-emotive and vice versa. It's based upon fact. Having that information readily available at hand for each subsequent negotiation is critical uh, to your being able to negotiate effectively with your suppliers. Tracking or good perform poor or good performance could also optimize your supply chain decisions uh, and also influence stakeholders, internal stakeholders, uh, to, to give guidance on possibly changing suppliers uh, or getting, getting support from them to stay with an incumbent um, over potential protests. Um, so using that data in supplier negotiations can influence utilization initiatives, compliance programs, improve pricing, and better SLAs. Uh, Christian's got uh, a couple of comments that he can add to that uh, that are evidential of, uh, of, of the importance of supplier performance data. Thanks, Mike. Um, so in, a, in an article by John Webb, who is a, a Forbes contributor on supply chain, uh, he states that conversations around performance often become really personal, especially when the person you're negotiating with um, could be, you know, the supplier who manages the people who deliver the goods or services, or could be, you know, a, a 20 year long term embed in the corporation that they work for and are personally invested in that corporation's mission. So when you track performance data historically, um, that conversation can be limited to objective fact. And then he also states that once you have the data you need, um, and you, you could determine if you're looking to change, uh, you know, performance with your incumbent, you could determine whether or not those changes have met. And also, if, you're, if you did change incumbents uh, or you change suppliers from an incumbent to a new supplier, you could track that um, supplier performance and then go to additional negotiations should there be some SLA shortfalls. And after a number of cycles of failed performance, again, you could always justify, um, you know, a, a removal of a vendor or whatnot. So it's, it's really important because this, this is the type of data that evidence supports that when you, when you track, it pulls the conversations out of the ethereal um, and into something more grounded and less emotive, um, which can actually improve your negotiation outcome. Great. Michael's got a great example here. Yeah, in a, in a recent negotiation that I was involved in uh, for a client, 
uh, a large chemical manufacturing company during an RFQ for low margin MRO components. Uh, the way we measured success in that, in that negotiation was not only savings, it was beyond savings. So uh, with a stakeholder influence and internal stakeholders, uh, which was basically an engineering team, um, the buying team wanted to increase competition in this category. And to do that, they invited four new suppliers to bid versus the incumbent who they had a previous uh, five-year relationship with, a year-on-year -year negotiation. Uh, so we compared the responsiveness of all suppliers as well as their cost savings. Um, and there's two components here that I want to call out uh, that uh, during our breakout session, um, I spoke with August and Andrew, and August stressed the importance of having stakeholder influence, and Andrew stressed the importance of responsiveness uh, from your suppliers being a key component to their success stories. So the buying team chose to execute the RFQ using an AI-driven sourcing technology that measured each supplier's response, not only to uh, best price, but also non-price related requirements, such as T's and C's, free delivery, et cetera. And not only were they measuring what the response was, but how quickly they responded. Uh, as a result of collecting all that data, the buying team was able to shorten the RFQ for that annual bid from three months to four days. Um, so issuing the award to the supplier who responded with greater speed and willingness to meet all requirements over the incumbent. And by the way, the cost savings, even though that wasn't the only decision factor, was a 21% cost reduction versus the incumbent bid. So the key takeaway here is great cost savings, double digit, but also when you look at because of the responsiveness uh, of the supplier, look at how much it shortened that negotiation cycle um, versus previous experience. That's a big win from a soft cost standpoint and a total cost of ownership. Absolutely. And, and one additional point there is that a lot of the things that they captured as far as data points um, were indicative of performance and future performance uh, as, and to meet SLAs such as TNCs and free delivery. Uh, and, and tracking whether or not and how they performed on those requirements in the RFP ultimately informed their decision. And as Mike has in bold here, brought uh, the time to close from, from three months to four days. Uh, and I also want to touch on the fact um, that we, we've, we've made a discussion about AI replacing humans. All of this is just simply driven by humans. The AI is driving faster decision making, but the decision making is still all done um, by sourcing managers and by the people with the wherewithal and the know-how. Yeah, Christian, I'm glad you called that out. Um, something that uh, Christian and I both firmly believe in, um, when it comes to technology, whether it's some form of digitization, some form of artificial intelligence algorithm that you're applying to your decision-making process, no technology, no AI, is going to ever top the collective knowledge of your best buyers. Uh, there's right. nothing that could top that. You know, to what Amanda pointed out earlier in her presentation, look at that comparison between brain power and actual computers. Um, so these solutions and what we're talking about now in terms of data are tools uh, to kind of keep history and also help you to make better decisions going forward. So let's keep that in mind. Um, we have an audience question here. Uh, again, we'll keep following our process. Uh, what has been the impact of communicating urgency in your negotiations with your suppliers? What do we mean by urgency? Um, so urgency is kind of emotion related, emotive demand data. Now, I meant, we mentioned this earlier in one of our other slides. Um, to the extent that that emergency is coming through in your communications with your suppliers, it could tip them and either increase or decrease their likelihood of cost improvement. Um, you know, typically here uh, where we where we 
we've all experienced this. You know, when we've had long-term uh, relationships with incumbents, uh, like that chemical company example I just gave a little while ago, uh, the incumbents really aren't motivated. Um, they, uh, so when you commun communicate urgency, it could always, uh, it, it could typically end up being, here's the price, you know, we're not flexing down, this is what it is. Uh, but as we know, demand is more than volume. Demand can also be demonstrated to a supplier in the form of urgency, which can increase or decrease your leverage. Um, an examination of demand uh, trends extrapolated over time, over his history, can help you to understand and normalize uh, bullwhips, supply chain inefficiencies. Thanks, Mike. Christian? Uh, yeah, there, I want to get to the evidence, but there's one more point I want to touch on uh, that Amanda made before we move away uh, from just the AI uh, point, which is that the best artificial intelligence tools that you will find in supply chain are the ones who only automate the toilsome tasks associated with sourcing, whether that be management of suppliers via outreach, um, your data aggregation, um, so look for the tools that allow you to do your job quicker and better and take the busy work off of your plate. Um, there's no need to be scared of AI. It's, it's, it's one of the best tools out there happening right now. And, and there's a lot of reason to be excited that it's coming into procurement. Um, so now I want to kind of put it back into this evidence. Um, the evidence to support urgency is actually a very, it's one of my favorite case studies on negotiations that has ever been done. Um, it was done by Colorado State University in 1984 with a partnership with Johnson Controls. Um, what they studied were seven independent hydroelectric power negotiations um, between the Department of Fish and Game and hydroelectric power companies um, for FERC licensing. So what they found was that when urgency was demonstrated by Fish and Game to close a deal, um, that more environmental concessions were made by fish and game and the hydroelectric power company uh, kind of had a win and the inverse is true as well. When there was some urgency demonstrated by the hydroelectric power company, uh, the fish and game department dug their heels in and were able to get more environmental protections and wildlife protections out of the hydroelectric power companies um, than they were if they expressed the urgency. The, the most interesting part of this study to me is that the, they found when neither party had any urgency, some of these negotiations lagged on for years. And the only way they can make like slow, incremental and, and minute incremental needle movements were to negotiate via memoranda of understanding over many, many rounds and many, many years. Uh, so depending on which party looks urgent or displays urgency, or communicates urgency is, is generally where you'll see the concession. And I have some, some good examples from my professional career here. And I have one from the supplier side and one from the buyer side. Um, so the supplier side communication of urgency, um, I advise a lot of tech startups. And um, one, of, one of the companies I advise is a growing B2C company in the cannabis space. And um, they, they have about 40 employees or they're seated here in California. And in a growing and complex negotiation for partial employment services from a publicly traded company, uh, the salesperson communicated that like he wanted to include the sale in the, in the closure of his quarters so he could get his commission. And he communicated that urgency two or three times. And, and when the person who was negotiating it told me that and, and expressed that they now had some sort of urgency, I, I said, don't put that urgency onto yourself leverage that urgency uh, and the negotiator was able to uh, kind of throw the, uh, the salesperson off of their quarterly targets by feigning a lack of urgency. I don't really have a need for this. Why don't you tell me you know, what you need? And he was able to shift the leverage away from a Fortune 100 publicly traded PEO company and gain favorable terms and pricing despite a huge asymmetry in negotiation leverage. You're talking a sub million dollar revenue startup in California um, you know, negotiating with a, a 40,000 employee, 10 state present, Fortune 100 publicly traded company. Um, and they were able to close the deal quickly, get it on their terms and come up with a deal that they felt good about. Now in the inverse, um, in a negotiation for radio pharmaceuticals, 
a small hospital that I was consulting with lost their leverage um, by telling the suppliers they were sourcing a new agreement to replace an existing one that expired in 90 days. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, how many of you guys are familiar with Radio Pharmaceuticals, um, but they are a constantly decaying nuclear isotope that is injected into patients for uh, contrast in imaging. Think a PET scan, a CAT scan, uh, you know, a cardiac rhythm management tool. And uh, knowing the complexity of the market and the impending decision point, the, the, the suppliers were constantly submitting their proposals um, at what we benchmarked to be about 15% above market um, and less favorable delivery terms. Um, some of those nuclear isotopes have half lights as short as 20 minutes. So you're talking about high dosages that then decay on their way to the patient. And the buyer ultimately had to settle on a contract extension with their incumbent, despite the service issues that were actually necessitating the transition away in the first place, and had to hit the pause button and go to market again the following year um, because they communicated their urgency. So it's, it's best to kind of keep your cards close to your vest and uh, only show as much of your hand as, as you, you view as necessary to achieve your outcomes uh, and, and get to that mutually beneficial point. Great, Christian, thank you for all of that. So folks, uh, we're coming to the uh, end of the presentation here and uh, some conclusions that, uh, that we wanna call out. Uh, behavioral data has the potential to create a mutually beneficial outcome for both buyers and suppliers. And I know that uh, this has been more of a buying skewed uh, talk uh, when it comes to the negotiation process. But the key here, folks, is if it's communicated and done correctly, uh, using behavioral data appropriately and in good faith uh, will result in mutually beneficial outcomes. Uh, we learned also that urgency is a key lever uh, that can change or influence the outcome of a negotiation. Um, so in the process of your communications, uh, and Christian just mentioned this uh, uh, just now, uh, you know, maybe uh, keep a certain conservative tone uh, to the level of urgency that you're communicating. Uh, performance data, both on the stakeholder and supplier uh, sides of that, uh, can optimize an incumbent negotiation or help justify, as the example I gave you, the transition uh, uh, over an emotive response or emotive protest. Responsiveness data can indicate at the outset of a negotiation who will be a likely better partner over the long-term relationship. Um, and then there's a lot more to utilization data than just utilization. And examining why, the why and how of stakeholder utilization behavior can help you to optimize your negotiation, your long-term relationships, and ultimately improve the overall health of your supply chain decisions. Christian? Thanks, Mike. Uh, I wanna take Michael's concessions and um, just add some caveats. Um, one, uh, data fatigue is a real thing. I can't tell you uh, how many times I've opened my inbox to find a cloud attachment for a 45,000 line Excel spreadsheet and just, um, you know, rolled my eyes and, and, and rubbed them and, you know, kind of got tired by just the mere prospect of combing through that data. Uh, that's a very real thing that can slow your throughput. So be mindful of, of kind of what you pick and choose to, to use. Um, Piggybacking off that, one of my favorite terms that was coined recently is called infobesity, um, which is that data is a great thing, but too much of it can really be a bad thing. And when you suffer from infobesity, um, you can make decisions actually harder to make and you can slow your throughput. Um, and and I, I mentioned this before, but data can overcomplicate. So pick and choose which sourcing endeavors you use to leverage um, for each. Um, if it's a small negotiation or you're comfortable with your incumbent, some of this responsiveness and behavior data might not be important to you. Um, but in other larger negotiations or more impactful service levels, that, that might be uh, uh, you know, a good thing to track. Michael has a couple great points here on uh, data decay that I'd like to throw to him. Yeah, thanks, Christian. Um, data decay, and keep this in mind, folks, and this is, this is actually 
uh, across all types of data, it can be a problem. Um, the world's largest commercial data provider, uh, you could probably all do the math and figure out who that is. I won't mention names. I used to work for them. Um, they have data fidelity loss of about 30 to 60% per year. Um, and their third largest data project, their product is supplier risk data. So uh, back to Erie's, uh, one of Erie's questions earlier in the conversation talking about what data management tools do you use? Um, I am gonna tell you that the best data is self-updated data. So as you're negotiating with your suppliers and capturing information and using your data capturing tools to collect that information, the information that you put in is the best and most relevant information that you have to, to fall back on going forward. Thanks, Mike. And then of course, there's, yep, thanks brother. No, go, go for it. Well, and then of course, there's things like COVID. Um, you know, uh, there's a term that everybody's familiar with called blank happens. Well, uh, this is a perfect example of the last six months uh, of what could happen uh, that we can't foresee, but will definitely skew uh, behavioral data. So keep that in mind always that uh, things can throw a curveball into this whole process. Uh, just be aware of that possibility. And all you can do with that case is react to it when you need to. Uh, and remember both parties in negotiation can use the same data to optimize the outcome. And finally, um, we, we just dropped our content here, our contact information. Uh, we, we really appreciate you guys having us here. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. Um, you know, as a, as a New Jersey native myself, I'm, I'm sorry I can't be there. Uh, and, I, and I'm looking forward to attending next year, hopefully. And, and I just want to say thank you. Uh, and I'm sure Michael has a couple words that he would like to wrap with. Yes. Thank you, uh, Kathy, Robert, Jeff. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the privilege of talking to the, uh, to the group, to the membership here. Uh, it's been fun. Uh, thank you to the people who've already engaged with me on LinkedIn. I love it. Uh, always love increasing the network. And uh, Christian and I are available. You know, you could probably tell from, from our tone in this conversation, uh, we're both kind of data geeks. So uh, anytime we have an opportunity to, uh, to engage and talk about this topic, uh, it's fun for us. So please feel free to reach out uh, and any questions you have, happy to answer. Thank you, guys.